Thank you so much, Sanctuary, for giving me some Sanctuary, because we need Sanctuary in this very dire hour of human history. When our nation, the United States of America, is engaged in the destruction of planet Earth, not just the planet Earth's environment, not just the human beings and other animals who live on it, but the very planet itself. This is our nation. This is our nation engaged in nuclear energy, knowing its destructive power, looking at Fukushima. This is our nation that's engaged in the invasion of Africa for the fifth time, mass murder. Our nation with 28 AFCON bases. This is our nation that we talk about tonight that's killing these children, sending them into prisons, and arresting those men and women and children who stand for justice, for human rights. Russell Schultz is one of 100 plus of those men and women uh, who are in jail tonight as political prisoners. We owe them, we owe ourselves an opportunity to challenge our nation, our nation. It's, it said I've come out of the Southern Civil Rights Movement, but I come out of a Southern family which was attached to something called slavery as well. Um, and that has been important to me in that I had a grandmother who tried to run away during slavery and I, we always laugh about her because she didn't know anything about a North Star. She was from the deserts of Africa and had no idea of looking behind no trees, looking for anything. All she knew was that she wanted to get her child and get away, so she went the wrong way. Uh, so <laughs> as I stand here tonight remembering Katie and knowing now that her people are being invaded again in Mali, Africa, the home of the oldest university on planet Earth at Timbuktu, just short of here, just north of Troy, where Timbuktu, Africa stood, in the 1700s and 1800s, especially after 1825, 1830, sponsored by Garrett Smith, who hired a man named Henry Highland Garnett, who was the pastor of a very small Presbyterian church right here in Troy, New York. So just remembering, remembering that, I want to talk about the Underground Railroad. And I want to have you travel with me to a very cold season in 1859. I want you to come with me to Harper's Ferry where a man is on trial for having stood up against the murder and imprisonment of more than two million Africans in something we call slavery. These Africans were prisoners of war primarily fought wars on their own shores against their own and against the Europeans, lost those wars, and as a result were in the U.S. enslavement. We always say slaves, but I want you to know slave is not a replacement for human beings. These Africans that he stood for were themselves also Django, because many of them were always restless and always struggling to poison somebody as a way out, to burn down farms, cotton fields for miles as a way out, a mass revolt like Nat Turner, Gore, Denmark Vesey. And you, I think you hear me coming in your direction, don't you? Because the Maroons you're talking about were housed in New York City, and they were housed here at Troy. Troy is very special. New York City was burned to the ground nearly in 1712 by those Maroons. Those Africans who refused to be re-enslaved after the Dutch had freed them from slavery. New York has a powerful history that hasn't been told because those who win the war tell the story of slavery. So you talk about the South and you really don't tell that story but you don't talk about New York. I want to talk about New York tonight because New York was the founding stone 
in a massive building against Western imperialism. It was not a black stone or white stone, or a red stone for that matter, but all of those stones combined together, struggling against something called an indentured shoe, as if that was a very pleasant experience. Wasn't it nice to have a master? Was an you were an indentured slave. That's if you were lucky, because if you were Scott and my Scott grandfather, and I did say grandfather, because my father is the first generation born free. My Scott grandfather <laughs> didn't get on the boat looking for no indentured shoe. He was tossed on the boat, like hundreds of thousands of other Scots, landing many of them in the USA, most of them in the Jamaica area, as slaves. They were not free. So the word indenture in its own right needs to be examined because you could be placed into a permanent indenture for a minor infraction. There are case after case after case. There's a wonderful work called In the Matter of Color, Slavery and the Law. It's written by a US judge, a black judge. It's going on to glory now, I think. Hopefully it's glory. Uh, named A. Leon Higginbottom. Pick it up and read it, because the American Constitution is grounded in slavery. There are numbers of writers, white and black, who talk about the grounding of that Constitution in slavery. It's built on the back of my ancestors, all my ancestors, including my mother's people, called these days Indians. We need to look at that, but then we need to look at New York. Because New York is not what it seems. So on that cold day in December, when a brother is on his way to the gallows, Albany, New York had sent a message, and Albany, New York was the second seat of the Underground Railroad. The building where the Urban League was standing when I left here in 19, you know, in 2000, <laughs> was the home of the Underground Railroad for upstate New York, and it was the major seat next to Cincinnati, which was the largest seat for the Underground Railroad. Secret, of course. I taught the grandson of the brother who ran the Underground Railroad for New York. And I want to say this, because I want to come out of speech mode, because I want really, really want to talk to you, because we need to begin to understand what, who we are and the ground we're standing on and how we, the Numeroons, have a real war to fight if we are going to save this planet from ourselves. Because in the words of the king, Martin Luther King, blood is on our hands. When our nation does something, we are bloody. When a so-called master, and God knows that language is kind of interesting, does something, who's responsible? All of us are responsible. We're the responsible parties. John Brown understood that. So on that cold day when Robert E. Lee led the Virginia militia from the Virginia University out into an open field hidden from everywhere, along with Professor Stonewall Jackson, cold day, December the 2nd, 1959 as a part of a firing squad. And do you know who else was on the firing squad? A man named John Wilkes Booth. I want you to tell me who was John Wilkes Booth. Who knows who he was? Come, just say it loud. You start right with me, I won't fight you. I don't bite ever, now never, never, never bite on Fridays. He was a man that assassinated the President of the United States. So on a cold field in Virginia on December the 2nd, 1859, Robert E. Lee, who will lead the what? The Confederate troops. Stonewall Jackson, who will terrorize and kill every African he can find in Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, and Northern Mississippi professor at the University of Virginia Military School, and John Wilkes Booth, his student. These are the three men who sent the great man home. 
The great man was who? John Brown. John Brown, son of Troy, born in Connecticut. But it was in Troy that he got his ground in. It was in Troy that he was schooled along with a whole number of others. I'm going to get there. So, but I want to take you back to this day because you don't know where you stand in. I don't think you know how powerful your region is. When they heard that John Brown had been arrested and were sure that he would be assassinated, Auburn in New York sent a message, and Auburn in New York was conservative in that hour. And this is a region of pro-slavers and anti-slavers. But Auburn in New York sent a message, please let us know by cablegram the moment the old man is hung. Are you listening to me? And they did. The agreement was that they would take his body to, since nobody in, in, in Harper's Ferry would certainly embalm his body, to take it to Philadelphia if they could get through the mob of Southern whites. But he would be embalmed. And it was so rough getting there that they decided that Mrs. Brown should come back by train and John Brown's body would be embalmed in Philadelphia and taken back by sea. But when he arrived in New York City, and they knew he was coming, the cannons were already flying out of Auburn in New York, opening the Civil War. What did I say the Civil War opened? The first cannons fired at the death of John Brown, and they were fired in numbers of flight sites across this nation, was Auburn in New York, the second seat of the Underground Railroad. And when that body hit New York City and hit the train trail headed north, on both sides of the river, lined as deep as they could be with those who were pro and against slavery. But in this hour, everybody was lined to salute the old man coming home, coming home to Troy, New York, on his way to North Elba, to his farmhouse. They were nine knee-deep slave. They were nine knee-deep nine knee free. But the Africans owed so much. And the colored Methodist churches, which had been the trail of the Underground Railroad that's not talked about. So when I come here to this African Methodist church and I see 1796, I know that it's a part of the Underground Railroad because that was the task of the African Methodist Episcopal and the African Methodist Zionists and the United Church of Christ and the Presbyterians in that hour of human history. But the little colored churches along the road had turned out all their folk. And the black men were standing, standing as soldiers. And as a southern child who only had seven great men taught to me in segregated school, because unlike other kids, I got African history. I got black history. John Brown was the seventh man. And so I always almost get tears when I think about this man who paid such a price for his moral integrity and my freedom. And the black troops were singing. Have you ever sang it? Sister Lady would say she wrote it, but the tra black folks standing on those <laughs> along that riverbank were singing his truth. His marching on as they prepare for war. As they prepare for war. Of the coming of the Lord. Trampling through the venture to where well, his grapes of wrath are stored. Oh, yes, he was. As they stood there on the banks of the Hudson, watching the train pass by because it didn't stop. The federal troops had said it wouldn't stop. The Fugitive Slave Act. So the federal brigade that's bringing John home is not to stop the train. But they didn't know New York. Oh, yeah, honey, talk to me. When they got to Auburn, they just slowed it down. But, uh, of course, the brigades that would raid Albany, raid Albany understood that Albany would take stuff. You could take a fugitive slave out of Albany. <laughs> but you didn't take a fugitive slave out of Troy unless you were. You were prepared to die. They didn't care who you were. They would fight you night and day and chase you for scores of miles according to the traitors who came in here, according to the members of the Union Army who came here under the Fugitive Slave Act. They would chase you miles to kill you. 
They didn't want to just whip you. They wanted you to never return. So when that train pulled into the station here, Troy, New York, Troy not only took the train, black and white, they held the train 24 hours, <coughs> properly funeralized John Brown, and then they, and not the Union Army, took him home. with John's story, but it's a small part of a bigger story. It just hasn't happens to be the finalizing moment that will open up the Civil War, where people will make a final decision that these people in the South will not bend, that this government, whether it be Lincoln or Stevens, other great Southerners, will not bend that we, the people, have to follow in the path of the great leader. So that we see Vincent Benet, we see uh, Thoreau, we see Ralph Waldo Emerson, we see all the great writers gathering, and the six men who financed the campaign of John Brown, all white, all with money and prestige all hiding in this hour because they don't want to be arrested by the American government and, and, and accused of an attempt to overthrow the United States of America as opposed to slavery. They all began to prepare for the next phase. The myth and the legends and everything that come out of this time period is a preparation for war, a preparing of the mind that there is no of the way that John Brown was not a madman. No, he was not, and neither was the men who fought with him. John Brown had worked with Frederick Douglass. In fact, he met Douglass right here at Troy. And Brown spoke to Douglass probably of a plan. Garrett Smith, Henry Highland Garnett. And I bring that name because he's the father of black nationalism. And it is because of him that Brown's body will not leave Troy, even though Henry Highland Garnett was now in where? New York City as pastor of Shallow uh, Presbyterian Church. He pastored here, a little small church, Presbyterian, uh, the colored church, probably right near here as I looked at um, at, at the date on this church, I know his church has to be very near here. He came here in 1840 to open up the ministry after being well-schooled in some of the finest institutions on the planet. But a jet black brother, so he wouldn't be confused with anything else, as a lot of the brothers were. A brother who was clearly not only African, but pan-African in everything that he did, but also a constitutionalist. He thought, unlike Frederick Douglass, that the Constitution did have possibilities, that you could use it as an argument. But he was very clear that the only way you free Africans is the Africans themselves must stand and must be willing to pay the ultimate price. That is the only way. There was no other way. The other ways had been tried. And he was unwilling to bend to anything else. So they were all getting preparations ready for the next phase. Right here in Troy. And other parts of upstate New York. Because if you went to Rochester, you will find the AME Zion Church, which is now possibly en route to becoming a dollar store. It's the home of the Black Star newspaper founded by Frederick Douglass, a North Star newspaper, not the Black Star. It is also the home of the women's movement because it was here that Susan B. Anthony begun her illustrious career. It is here that Harriet Tubman would preach 
and Soldier on the Truth, and so many others. That's upstate New York. That's not down in Manhattan. That's not Philadelphia. That's certainly not Baltimore. And you know it's not Jackson, Mississippi. I want to be clear that you are on hallowed ground in upstate New York. The Underground Railroad was a serious movement, running out of New Orleans, Louisiana, the biggest piece of it. Though we hear about Harriet Tubman, and I love to hear about my sister, she moves me. And this sister said she was a Harriet. I thought, hmm, a Harriet's in the house. <laughs> I've Harriet Tubman chilling, black woman slave. Born on a plantation in Maryland, gal. How oh, my rights depraved. Tell me how far the road to Canada? How far do I have to go? How far the road to Maryland and the hatred that I know? Harriet lived here. <laughs> right here in Troy. <laughs> You're on such hallowed ground. It's very difficult to talk about a movement from New Orleans, Louisiana, a movement uh, from the east coast of the USA of Africans and their compatriots. Oftentimes whites who are also poor whites, or whites who have gotten in other kinds of trouble, getting through the woods and the mountains and the streams uh, through the, some of the caves that they have explored. They had a, the, union, the United States government commissioned a general, a black general, to study Harriet's trails. And he said she couldn't have done it. And I say, uh, why couldn't she have done it? And he said, I said to General Parks, tell me, why couldn't she have done it? He said, because those caves were too dangerous. <laughs> said they didn't know Harriet. <laughs> and you sure don't know Harriet. Uh, so this underground railroad that came up the Mississippi River through the center bed of the country into that region that John, John Brown would go into when he went into Kansas, right up through Illinois, all the way upstream, when it spread out through the Great Lakes, and probably a long part of the trail we call these days the Erie Canal. That underground railroad that went through Cincinnati, with Cincinnati being the strongest piece of it. That underground railroad may be running today. And I want you to be clear because it's what? It's an unseen trail with unknown conductors and many, many train stops so that Africans and enslavement would talk about, would sing about. This train is a freedom train. This train is a freedom train. You can only ride it in a freedom name. Ride this train. I've been got church started up here, y'all, so be careful now. Uh, so we here at Troy, where Garrett Smith had commissioned Henry Highland Gunnett to pass out thousands of acres of land in what we know is the area right here beyond North Elba, New York, thousands of acres, to Africans from New York City to come up and farm, to come up and farm this land. He also did something else, and I want you to begin to put things together, because you've got to be smarter than the American government. They couldn't put this together. <laughs> They'll take a little boy in Mississippi to put together in 10 minutes. Uh, he hired John Brown to train these Africans from New York City in how to farm. Now, can you imagine that in the 1840s and 50s? See, most people, when they think about New York, they think about this big, huge town, all urban, no farms around. <laughs> New York is as much farmland as upstate in that hour of history. Slavery is over. Graduated slavery ended in 1827. Henry Highlands Garnett's from B Baltimore, Maryland, where they took in 90% of the population of slaves were below the age of 16. His grandfather, an African chief of the Mandingo tribe, very witty and very smart and with skills and everything from uh, 
Horseshoe and what do you call it, uh, Smith and the whatever, caught the confidence of Colonel Spencer, his master, who called him Joseph because he was so smart and so much like Joseph in the Bible, introduced him to Christianity, <laughs> but didn't understand that Joseph was an African. And not just an African chieftain, but an African in his heart. And he came from a place where indigenous people, all people in Africa were indigenous people at this hour, believe that I am because we are. Because we are, I am. That is the first step toward being a human. And Colonel Spencer, if you be no slave, you be no friend of mine. Massa or not, he didn't understand that because he didn't understand that he was not a part of the humanness, the wholeness that makes us one people in many colors, all extending from some black sister. I don't know whether she's out of Chad because her most recent find actually has been a male, eight, about 8 million years old, and we need to begin to look at these finds, by the way, out of a Chad and male this time and not uh, Lucy, the female, which was found in Ethiopia. There have been a number of finds since Lucy. But as we look at this slaves, he took his whole family north. They spread out, went through Delaware, and from Delaware went to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, went into New Jersey, Greenwich, and then they waited a half year and came as a family. I'm talking about eight family units. Eight family units. Unheard of in a runaway case. So this tells you that these people are being what? led by some skillful organizers, and they wind up around Mott Street in Manhattan. Years later, they will be raided by Maryland Raiders. Garnett's father will have to jump from a building. It's not clear whether he lost his life in that from the readings I've been doing, but he had to jump from a building trying to escape. Garnett was at sea, and when he returned, he returned and said at that moment, we're going to have to fight, and I will never be without a weapon. So this is the man that came to Troy to pastor a church. This is the man that, from 1840 to 1848, pastored the Presbyterian churches of Troy. He gathered around him all of the other men and women, and there were plenty of sisters. Not just Harriet, who was here. Harriet was here in 1861 to free her brother. And I know you know about him because on one of the bank buildings here. Charles Knapp. We should talk about him, honey. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the man that Harriet actually freed. Of course, there was a mob of 4,000, 2,000 on each side. So this is the spirit that he built here along with John Brown and along with others. So we don't, I don't want to keep you tonight. I will say that there's some works that you should pick up and I will give them to you. I will mention them tonight. You should look at to purge this land with blood by Stephen Oates, looking at John Brown. William E. Burgard Du Bois, John Brown. Herbert Aptecker, John Brown. And a wonderful book on Henry Highland that has a number of passages on Henry Highland Garnett, written by Sterling Stuckey. And Henry Highland Garnett's uh, master mentor, David Walker, who published the Walker's Appeal asking the slaves in the South to rise up. You're standing on hallowed ground. This is Troy, New York. You're standing in an hour when you're going to have to do what happened right here in Troy after the Civil War ended and industrialization was mounting and this was a massive industrial center. But it also was the, one of the most polluted areas of the country. People were dying of all kinds of lung diseases, especially TB. And the black brother, architect, built right up here on a hill somewhere in Troy, a wonderful park so that women and children could come up to the park and get fresh air. Fresh air. This is Troy. Did y'all know that? This is Troy. When I'm in Troy, I know that I'm standing on sacred ground of revolutionaries who were looking at the environment. 
who looked at farming and new farm techniques. When I'm in Troy, nothing you can do will surprise me. Nothing. Because all of the revolutionaries that have come through here have come through here with the intent of building something that didn't look like capitalism. <laughs> Henry Highland Gannett, Garrett Smith, who himself was a financier, talked about ending forever what we know as capitalism, slavery, and developing what they call the wage system. But Garnett said, that doesn't look like it's enough. We must also end monopoly of land. We are talking about pre-Civil War. Pre-Civil War. So echo socialism begun where? I, you know, you didn't say it like you meant it. <laughs> Document it. Go to the books I give you. They have nothing but the sources for anything you need for this hallowed and sacred house in which you live. Troy, I will be back up on April the 13th. Right. Yeah. I will be at Russell Sage, where we are going to talk about the Underground Railroad. So I've given you a spark of the speech. But Coley Clark, as any, uh, my students will tell you, doesn't do anything without doing what this wonderful young man did on his home this, horn this evening. And that is having some music, because Africans don't function without music. I come out of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We open with music, and we close what we shall overcome. We're the music people. Fifty years ago, my great friend, my first mentor, my first employer, Medgar Wiley Evers, for whom I was special assistant for the state of Mississippi, was assassinated. We don't know who assassinated him, though they sent one man to jail, but that's a lie because the FBI informed my first husband, who was also brought down the same night of Medgar, but not as bad. He lived, but not Lafayette Jr. He lived, but the brother doesn't talk anymore. You know, you don't know about men. Men are strange. Uh, but the FBI informed us that the, the, there was a conspiracy to kill three men. We didn't inform ourselves. This came from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, United States Justice Department, United States government. The conspiracy was to kill a brother in New Orleans, but not Lafayette in Selma, Alabama, where we had gone to found the Black Belt Alabama Voting Rights Movement for the Student Unbound Coordinating Committee, on which Dr. King will put his apparatus for the last phase for the right to vote. That's the Lafayette Project at Alabama. I happen to be Lafayette's wife, but I'm also field secretary, so don't, don't, don't get confused now. He got confused and I left him. Uh, <laughs> I don't wanna leave you. <laughs> uh, that then, they were, Medgar went down. Medgar's down, so I ask you to join me in just saying a little brief piece with me Everybody please stand. Sister, may I have your hand? Two in the baby. If y'all would just check hands somehow. And the stars will pass right over left. She's got a baby, so I'm not going to struggle with it. But I want you to say with me, I am. 